The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. You guys hear me all right? Yep, cool. All right, I am Mark Hinkle. I'm the VP of community at cloud.com. Uh, there's a little bit of my background, but I'm an open source guy. I've had the privilege to work on a lot of open source projects. I like the idea of open source for a lot of reasons, both idealistically and pragmatically. And uh, this is for a long time, a big time desktop Linux advocate. Um, not so much anymore, but uh, um, Anyhow, uh, what we're going to talk about today is cloud computing and specifically open source tools that allow you to accomplish cloud computing tasks. <clears throat> um, I put my slides up on SlideShare. Um, if anybody asks me for the slides, I always forget to, to let you know that, but they are on um, SlideShare and you can download them if you want to look at them afterwards. All right, we're going to look at quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud computing. Um, I have a pet peeve about cloud computing. Um, there's a lot of marketing people out there that have taken their old busted software, said it's connected to the internet, and that makes it cloud. That's not the case. It's my big pet peeve. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about overview, what cloud computing actually is, and I'm going to really dive into the tools to deploy and manage specifically infrastructure as a service. And finally, we'll do a little uh, Q&A, which I think will probably be the most valuable to you guys. All right. This is one of my favorite uh, cartoons. It's a little Dilbert about um, with every new IT trend, there seems to be a rash of consultants telling you about this IT trend that have absolutely no experience in the field. There's a lot of them out there in cloud computing. Um, hopefully. Uh, I don't fall into that category. I'm going to try and prove that uh, I know a little bit today and try and set you guys down the path of, I'm going to give you a sort of a laundry list and give you a map, and then afterwards you should be able to go out and Google f and get involved in the communities that fit your needs. So recently, just to give you an idea of what people, I didn't have a great idea of what people wanted to do in the cloud. You know, you see the commercials, if you work for a company that gets Gartner Research, they're like cloud this, cloud that, cloud washing is rampant. Um, so what I did was I, I polled uh, our community, uh, the, the Bitnami, which makes uh, virtual machine images for the cloud, and uh, Xenos user communities this spring, to get an idea of what people's intention was with the cloud. I'm going to pu publish that survey next week, but here's some of the findings. Reasons for people to adopt the cloud. Hardware savings was at the top of the list. I'm going to tell you right now, I think hardware savings is good, but I don't think that's the biggest benefit of the cloud. I think faster deployment of infrastructure is a big deal. All of a sudden, the opportunity cost from what it takes from having a need till you get something deployed, that's a big benefit. How many people here are systems management guys? Okay. I think that's a huge opportunity for for us in systems management, because in the past, when you're working with legacy hardware, you have you know, a mishmash of systems, things to instrument. All of a sudden, now you've abstracted out all your infrastructure into this, this cloud, it makes it heterogeneous across the whole uh, stack. Um, finally, <clears throat> open source usage. I love open source. I think it's great. I like the fact that it's supported by users, driven by users who have real problems to solve. When I polled these people, I was happy to see how many people used open source whenever possible. 
I think open source from an idealistic standpoint is great. I think from a pragmatic state standpoint, it's even better. What kind of stuff? Yeah. So the question was, um, did we distinguish between open source and open standards? And, and it was very clearly stated that open source software, so, which I think open source and open standards are equally important in, in interoperability and some other re reasons. But uh, um, anyhow, the, the uh, types of cloud computing that people were planning to use this year were compute, so that is your Virtualized machines running in an abstracted way in the cloud. Um, cloud storage, which both of those two things fall under a category we call infrastructure as a service, and I'll dive into that a little bit later. And then platform as a service, where in the infrastructure as a service, you're abstracting your base infrastructure and platform, and as a service, you're abstracting up to your development layer. Why open source? I don't think I really need to go into it this deeply because we're all at a Linux fest, but um, the number one thing for me that, that I, I think is important is that it is, you know, you put your money where your mouth is. You can download, try and use the software, and you can interact with other users in an open community. That's the big thing for me. But in the cloud, I think it's important that you have open data, open standards, and open APIs, and open source communities generally adhere to the other two beyond the... Uh, all three of those things. Okay. So here is the, I don't think it's clear to everybody what cloud computing is. Just because something's connected to the internet and the public telephone net cloud, it does not mean it's cloud. It is, there's some actual definition and characteristics that make things cloud. There are five characteristics, this is the um, definition that is generally accepted from the uh, National um, Institute of Standards. On-demand self-service. That is, that's a key tenet of cloud computing. You should be able to go to a web page or a system and provision your own stuff, whether it is a virtual machine running in Amazon EC2, whether it's virtual storage running in Rackspace files, whether it's your own private cloud, and you have users, they should be able to go and generate their, their stuff, whatever that is, storage, compute power, et cetera. Broad network access. They're not just a T1 to your data center, but broad, high availability network access. That is one of the characteristics. Resource pooling. In the past, if you want to look at the difference between virtual private server and cloud, you have a single server that's broken up into slices and you have virtual machines running into it. In the cloud, you take multiple virtualized servers like that, combine them, and it's pooled together. That's resource pooling. Rapid elasticity. Rapid elasticity means that the amount of compute power and storage and other assets are available to you as you need them. And finally, as, the, as you grow and expand and contract, that you have measured service. Good example is Gmail. You get 10 gigs of storage free. When you go over that, you have the option to buy more. When you drop below that, you, you don't have to pay anymore, but you're measured and pay based on your usage. Those are the five characteristics. Now, when I say measured service, even if you're not buying from a hosting provider, but you're using an internal private cloud, what we call private cloud, you can now measure by user, what kind of resources are being used and by who. And in large enterprises, they like to do chargebacks, understand what part of the organization uses it. And that's, that's an appealing thing, too. <clears throat> Next thing is service models. So I would bet that most everybody here uses cloud computing in some way, shape, and form. And the most common way to use cloud computing is in software as a service. So that would be Gmail. That would be 
Salesforce.com. That would be Google Docs. Um, now, that's what I call the user cloud. And users of software are consuming software as a service. The next level, if it's a little below that, would be the development cloud. And that's called platform as a service. Examples would be Google App Engine. Um, uh, Salesforce bought a company called Heroku recently. Um, that's platform as a service. Uh, Windows Azure, Raxby Sites, and Red Hat bought a company called Macara, which I don't know if it's been released in open source yet, but it probably will be, knowing it's Red Hat. Um, and these are abstracting out your, your infrastructure to the development layer, to the platform, so you can de develop your Ruby, Python, Java apps as a developer and not have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. It should scale to meet your needs, and they've abstracted that to you. At the bottom of the level is the systems cloud or infrastructure as a service. This is abstracted virtualization and compute. Networking falls in there too. Examples, anybody here use Amazon EC2? Anybody use Amazon S3? Those are both um, IAS. Rackspace Cloud Files, that's an example. OpenStack is a project sponsored by Red Hat, or I'm sorry, or, uh, Rackspace. Um, Cloud.com delivers that, Eucalyptus, Ubuntu, Open Nebula. So those are the service models. Not to be confused with the deployment models. At a very simple um, level, you have public, private, and hybrid clouds. Public cloud implies that it's hosted out by someone else and you access it outside of your firewall. Private cloud, that's your cloud computing infrastructure that you use on your own hardware behind the firewall. And then there's the hybrid cloud. And this is what I think is probably gonna be the, it's like, uh, I'll give you an example of who does that. Farmville, okay, the company Zynga, the gaming company, they do Mafia Words and Farmville and all those Facebook games. They do a pr hybrid cloud, so they, they, when they have steady demand, they're running it in their private cloud. At seven o'clock or eight o'clock after people get home from work and start playing Farmville, I guess everybody plays Farmville all day from apparently from Facebook, but the bulk of their traffic comes in, they can level that by offloading some of that um, compute demand out to Amazon and other places. So it's, uh, they're using it for load balancing. Within the public cloud, um, people also do virtual private cloud, which is sort of security ring around private cloud. It is a term that's used. I don't know that the distinction needs to be there, but if you hear that, they're probably meaning that there is a firewalled hosted cloud out there maybe within. Terramark is a big enterprise cloud company that um, offers these kind of services. All right. So that was clouds. Does so it make sense? We have SAS, PaaS, IAS. You can pronounce that how you would, but it sounds like S. Um, and then the service models. So now I'm gonna cover the different open source software out there that's available for you to create your own cloud and manage that cloud. Um, cloud computing still requires architectural design. So when I first started hearing this cloud stuff, I had this idea, like the way it was described to me is I have this web app and I just upload it to the cloud and all of a sudden that web app scales forever, it's highly available, it's you know, backed up, it just it runs like magic. That is not cloud computing yet. You still have to have design points. Um, did anybody see a couple, uh, I guess last month there was a big outage in Amazon. <laughs> Okay, Foursquare was down. So, you know, Amazon was at fault because there was, there was a problem with their um, RDS and their east, data center east, but the users were just as much as fault because they didn't do some things that constitute good architecture, which would mean having multiple geographic locations. So, um, they had all their stuff in the data center, eastern US data center. That data center had a problem and they didn't have any load balancing and distribution across multiple data centers. That might not be practical for everybody in every app, but if you have a service-based application with millions of users, I think that's pretty practical. Um, 
So you still have to have some rigor in your design. You have to have, if you need redundant storage, you have to plan for it. If you need to have geographical <coughs> uh, uh, multiple geographic geography served, you should distribute your data center as much as you can across the cloud. The also, cloud is not a magic one size fits all thing. You gotta figure out what you're gonna do at the end of the day. And typically, the use cases that I see that are popular, the ones that are pub publicized right now are like the Twitters of the world and the Zingas of the world doing these high performance computing, or uh, not high performance computing, high volume websites. The uh, other use case that I see that's very popular is sort of the dev test lab where people have their development, their test, and their production, and they have a way to make their infrastructure consistent across all three labs, scale them out, and move them from production. That's what I think the system administrators of the world and the regular IT guys are gonna see as their private cloud first. Um, there's, other, there's other use cases and there's, um, but those are the two I think are, are good examples. One is a very public facing, hyper scalable, high volume kind of thing, and then one is just the next evolution of what you're probably doing with virtualization in your data center already. But as I said, you gotta design your architecture with the end in mind. The other thing, and I'm gonna touch on this when I get to the tools section quite a bit, is rec make your infrastructure replicable. Can you rebuild every part of your data center very quickly? And I mean abstracting out all your server configurations, adding your packages, and if a data center goes down or you need to scale up, you can do that without a lot of overhead. So when we talk about the compute cloud, at the very bottom level, the thing that you're gonna have to do is make a decision on hypervisors. I'm gonna talk about the open source hypervisors. Um, Zen and Zen Cloud Platform and KVM are gonna be the two most popular open source hypervisors to do compute clouds right now. VirtualBox, uh, how many people here use VirtualBox? I, I think VirtualBox is a good you know, single server virtualization solution, desktop virtualization solution. I don't know that VirtualBox is gonna be the hypervisor you're gonna wanna choose for the cloud. Um, some of the cloud compute environments out there do support it. Um, but I don't think for high performance um, cloud computing you're gonna see VirtualBox. OpenVZ, does anybody use OpenVZ? OpenVZ is really interesting because it's, uh, um, it's, it's great for um, people that are running a lot of the same application over and over, and there's some interesting people out there. There's some actual very specialized cloud um, computing um, use cases for that, but as a general cloud compute to, to take your VMware, Zen, virtualized servers to the next level right now, I, OpenVZ is not your solution. And LXC is sort of your user space rooted installs. The most popular hypervisor in use out there by far is VMware, proprietary. Um, in the cloud, I think you're gonna see a lot of people that are doing great scale are not gonna use VMware as much as the middle um, scale markets. I mean, VMware has a considerable expense especially when you're trying to bring up tens of thousands of servers, virtualized servers, I should say. Citrix Zen server is the commercialized version of Zen. Hyper-V and then Oracle VM, and Oracle VM is a variant of Zen, I believe. But the two for, the takeaway I would say is if you're doing general purpose, if you're doing cloud compute, IAS, Zen, and KVM. And KVM actually has some, uh, technical advantages that because it runs in, for stuff that runs in user space. Open source compute clouds. So this is the part where I'm gonna give you a disclaimer. I chose to go to work for cloud.com. That's what I'm always gonna tell you is best. I like the fact that these are open source and you can go download them. So take it with a grain of salt. But um, uh, last year, uh, cloud.com released our open source project CloudStock as a GPL um, project. CloudStack is a um, compute environment. It allows you to manage your virtualized st um, storage um, servers and, network and vir do virtual networking all in one package. Um, we have numerous 
clients throughout the year, uh, throughout the world, running large-scale clouds on it. Um, our domain language is Java. The guy who founded the company is Shen Luang, wrote the original JVM. He was part of James Gosling's team. Eucalyptus, they probably have the most tenure. And what they started out doing was uh, um, creating cloud computing software that um, kept compatibility between Amazon and their cloud. So EC2 and, and Eucalyptus's uh, cloud computing software um, used the same APIs and, and allowed you to move from uh, EC2 to your own private cloud seamlessly. Um, on the supported hypervisors here, I think that there's been some changes. I think there's probably more than I put on there, but I haven't been able to confirm them 100%. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. They probably, all these projects move pretty fast. OpenStack. OpenStack is um, very interesting to me. I'm sorry. OpenStack is a project sponsored by Rackspace and a number of other companies, which cloud.com is a supporter of it. Um, Ubuntu, I believe, is a supporter of OpenStack. And what they, they did was took this code that was developed for NASA by a company called Anso Labs, which is a system integrator that has since been acquired by Rackspace. And last July, they released their code under <clears throat> an open source license. And they have a lot of momentum because they have a lot of interest as um, a vendor neutral kind of widespread cloud compute platform. Um, what they do could be leveraged by a number of the other cloud providers, and that's why um, people like Ubuntu and us uh, participate with them. <clears throat> but right now there is a lot of overlap on how they handle virtualization orchestration. Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, um, it started with the, the Karma, the uh, Karmic Koala release. So does anybody know what koalas eat? That is a clever little joke. Koalas eat eucalyptus. So they packaged eucalyptus within their, um, their distribution to create the Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud. And uh, uh, that was their cloud compute platform. Just recently, I believe, they announced that they are going to, for Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, start packaging OpenStack instead of eucalyptus. Um, finally, Abiquo. The only reason I list Abiquo on there is because they do release cloud compute software um, under an open source license, and it seems to be legitimate, but I know the least about them. I don't, um, they're very, uh, the company behind it has been around for a long time, but they've really just recently pushed this cloud computing package out. So um, download it, try it, take a spin around their community, ask some questions. Those are the compute clouds and the hypervisors. So <clears throat> you have a hypervisor, you have cloud compute. Now you've got to store your images somewhere. And one of the most, uh, probably one of the most debated topics right now is how you do storage for your compute clouds. And um, a lot of it is distributed storage. Um, the uh, projects out there that, that do that, that are probably most interesting are Gluster FS. They do scale out NAS system that aggregates uh, storage over Ethernet or Infinite Man. Um, Ceph, which is a distributed file system storage that is developed by DreamHost. And I sort of like the idea of the, back to my original point, DreamHost is a user of distributed storage, so they're solving a problem. They're not trying to sell you software. So I, th I think that input is valuable in the evolution of storage systems. And I think other, if you're a managed service provider, they probably have a, a lot of similar issues that you have and you could learn something from them. OpenStack has two components, or actually three components to it, but on the compute side, the code name for compute is called Nova. On the storage side, um, it's called Swift. And that is, if you're a user of cloud, um, of Rackspace cloud files, their storage system. That's the underlying software that runs that. They've open sourced it. And that's long-term object storage. That's where you would store um, data, but not stuff that has heavy read rate, like your uh, system images and stuff like that. But uh, Sheepdog, 
Sheepdog's another interesting one. This is strictly for KVM hypervisors. It's, uh, the development is led by NTT, and um, right now it, it's, it's approaching, uh, there's some limitations. I think they can do 1,000 servers is the limit for Sheepdog, but they, uh, they work specifically with KVM. What I think you're gonna probably run into more times than anything else right now is people who are repurposing their existing infrastructure will be mounting their, their existing storage via NFS. So you might be have, if you have NetApp filers or open filers or um, other kinds of commercial storage, that's probably what you're gonna do. Um, there's some performance bottlenecks in NFS, but um, that is probably what I see more often than anything else. I'm not a storage guy, so um, I'm fascinated by that. So, where are we at? So, APIs. Almost every single one of these clouds has their own API. The problem is that every single these, one of these clouds has an API that's slightly different than the others. And why is that important? Because you have tools to manage these clouds, and on every single cloud, you'd have a different convention to call these APIs to start and stop virtual machines to do different things. So what has evolved are these abstractions that actually are a common API that map their API to different cloud service providers. So JClouds is a popular Java cloud abstraction um, written by a really smart guy called Julian Cole. Um, and they support a wide variety of clouds. So if you had a tool that provisioned virtual machines, you could write to JClouds and maybe provisioning them across Amazon, cloud.com, and Terramark, for example, if you had multiple clouds, so that you'd have some consistency in your tools and you don't have to retool, because one of the, the implied promises of the cloud is that someday you're gonna be able to move from vendor to vendor as simply as you move web hosting today, that kind of consistency across vendors, some kind of standardization. Not anywhere close to that today. LibCloud is another one, and Delta Cloud. Um, they are both um, Apache incubator projects right now, um, and Fog is another abstraction, and they are sort of, uh, um, they were developed, I believe, by Engine Yard, and they're sort of Ruby-based. Um, so the reason I bring up the open source abstractions is I think it's gonna be pretty important when we talk about tools. So this is sort of an, a rundown of the things we talked about. We have this hardware, I'm sorry. We have this hardware at the bottom layer. And then we have the OS and the VM manager. And then we have virtualized resources like computing network, storage. Then on this other, this other little red block here, the image and the image meta, metadata, that's worth noting because right now there isn't a well-adopted standard virtual machine image. There is a standard that has recently emerged called uh, OVF, and I think that over time that will be the standard virtualization image that works across all hypervisors. It's not only a machine image, but it also has some metadata attached with it so that you can understand what that virtual image holds. Today, if you're a VMware user, you might use, you can use OVF in recent versions, but probably um, VMDK is their standard. If you're a KVM user, it's uh, QCALs, if it's uh, Zen, there's another image format. So you can, can't just pick up one image and move it across, you have to use converters. So if you're converting images across hypervisors, um, anybody here use um, QEMU? There's some tool sets with QEMU that allow you to do conversion. A lot of, there's a lot of tools out there to make conversions, but if you build a cloud and you have a, two different hypervisors in there, you would have to have two different kinds of um, virtual machine images. Yes? Yeah. Oh, so, so the question was, if you're using LVM, could you just use raw images rather than a virtual machine image? And uh, really, it shouldn't matter. It's just a matter of what your hypervisor supports. Um, I don't know that every cloud platform supports that, though, because a lot of times they, um, they want to see those machine images. They're instrumented for specific machine images. But 
That's a good question. I actually will do a little research on that. All right, so, so at the bottom of the compute cloud, we have these abstracted resources, and then above that, we have the infrastructure as a service, which is that broad bottom layer, and some, some users consume that directly. If you're a platform as a service guy, you're probably consuming both, even though the infrastructure as a service layer is abstracted. Finally, as software as a service, you may be consuming all three or two of the three, um, but it's, it's transparent to you. So that's what's, what's really interesting in general about the cloud is that you've abstracted your infrastructure so that there's still somebody dealing with that hardware, but the bulk of the users using the cloud are not going to have to worry about, you know, when I, was, when I worked as a hands-on IT guy installing systems and you used to have problems with grade cards, you had to worry about, you know, um, you know capacity on your machines in a way that was... Um, tough to manage. Now you sort of have this abstraction, you have this pooled resources, you have this ability to, you have a, a level of flexibility that, that is really building on a lot of technologies that we already use today. On the right hand side we have the management, which is where we're going to talk about next. I think management of the cloud brings in some, some pretty unique uh, challenges. And then I have my little API abstraction. So you may be consuming something like um, Salesforce via browser or something else via command line. And a lot of clouds you're going to be um, interacting with through an API. And if you don't like the cloud's API, you can use an abstraction. All right. This is the part that I think is the unique challenge with the cloud. Because I can go to Amazon with a credit card and spin up a thousand servers in no time. Literally, you know, very, very quickly. But once I spin up those thousand servers, how do I actively manage the life cycle of those servers? Because before I had, the, when I had physical hardware, I had to order the hardware, I had to rack it up, I had to install an operating system. If I wanted to virtualize it, I virtualized it. I had all these steps to get to the point of having virtual machines running in my data center. Now, credit card, push a couple buttons, very, very easy to have a large infrastructure running very quickly. So, how do you scale? You can either, you know, I mean, hire more people. That's a linear scaling. If a sysadmin can manage five or 50 servers or 100 servers, and you're spinning up 1,000 a day, you've got to scale that way. Or you've got to figure out how you scale your sysadmins. And I think you've got to really think about how you, and the sysadmins, us, I call the meat cloud. And we got to figure out how we scale those people. And it's, um, I would say it's through automation. Um, there's a lot of movements out there on, um, that, are, um, cons that preach this kind of uh, scalability, automation, um, agility. And anybody here familiar with the term DevOps? OK. Um, prob that could be a whole talk in itself, but DevOps really uh, borrows a lot of the practices of agile development and applies them to operations. The idea of um, iterate often, um, have process but streamline bureaucracy. Um, plan, the, the other thing I like about DevOps, and the DevOps is the root of it, is development and operations. And at the be very beginning I said you've got to plan for your end use. That is, taking your development people and having them provide specifications of how their, their applications should be um, run in operations. Um, definitely worth Googling and reading about. But the thing that I, I want you to take away from today's talk for cloud management is you really got to think about scripting and automating repetitive tasks. And the tools I'm going to talk about really lend themselves to that. So why do I like open source tools versus proprietary tools, especially for cloud computing? It's because it's, it's fast moving, and open source guys tend to um, release early and release often. And I feel like they're the tool sets that are keeping up with the cloud computing trend better than anyone else. <clears throat> the other thing I like about open source tools is they're typically user developed and instrumented. And that's that's the other thing. So end users of cloud computing infrastructure are 
providing the instrumentation, instrumentation for configuration management and monitoring um, is my observation. The other thing is they're easily to assemble into tool chains and it seems like there's a culture there of integrating different kinds of tools together. <clears throat> so what makes tools cloudy, in my opinion, this is no hard and fast thing, but they're network capable, they're cloud aware. And what I mean cloud aware is they're instrumented for the cloud. So they, they have instrumentation for things like hypervisors, for network storage, um, monitoring has plugins for that, easy to integrate, here to open standards, lend themselves to automation. Not that I want to be too repetitive, but I want you guys to really um, go away with automation as a theme. So <clears throat> this slide, I got a credit to the man in the red shirt back there, Taurus Baylog, who, who brought to light the fact of what a um, service level really constitutes and how little time you have to recover from an outage. So if you are adhering to a four nines service level, you have 52.6 minutes out of the year to respond to that and resolve your outage or you're gonna blow your service level. In a month, that's only 4.32 minutes. So if your polling period for an outage is five minutes and you don't, aren't made aware of it within that polling period, you've blown your service outage before you even know about it. So polling in intervals might be important to you. Also, the ability to be alerted and recover from it. Till you are alerted, log into your machine, recover, you could have blown it. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Just something to think about when you're, uh, and, and the way people define and what groups and, and what uh, scope of infrastructure constitutes, constitutes a service level varies by organization, but really at the end of the day, um, high levels of service have very little room for error. So today I'm gonna to talk about four types of management tools. Provisioning, configuration management, orchestration, automation, and monitoring. How many people here are developers? Okay. So you guys all know what a tool chain is, right? Output of one, one system informs the input of another. That's how I want you to think about management tools for the cloud. Actually, I want you to think about management tools like that in general. That the output of your configuration management tool informs the input of some other tool, tells your monitoring tool what's configured and what to monitor. I want your provisioning tool to inform your configuration management tool. I want your monitoring tool when it has, there's a fault, if it makes sense, to automate the recovery of that. Now the danger with automation is it can fix things really, really fast. It can screw things up equally as fast. So um, for a long, long time, people at, smart people at IBM have preached autom autonomics. Um, and I think it's a good idea, but I also think there's certain simple things that you can automate and uh, help uh, stay within your service level and make it easier to recover from. Open source provisioning. How many people here provision their Linux servers with Kickstart? Okay. Cobbler? Okay, cool. So Kickstart, you create the specification, the spec file, Kickstart file, kick it off and it automates the install and, and basic configuration of a, system, a single system. Cobbler is very cool because it's a client server application that allows you to do that with a one-to-many um, relationship. So you can kick off multiple, you can pixie boot multiple virtual machines simultaneously, configure them and bring them into service very, very quickly. That is an awesome tool. It's part of the Fedora project. It's the most overlooked tool that once people use it, they are hooked. I highly recommend if you don't look at any other stuff in your Linux sysadmin when you're done here, go look at Cobbler. Um, Spacewalk is Another, another tool that um, is sponsored by Red Hat um, Fedora project, and it's sort of the satellite, Red Hat satellite server for open source. It's also pretty neat. Um, and Spacewalk does Fedora, CentOS, um, RHEL right now. 
Cobbler does as uh, moving into more and more of the non-RPM based distributions. Uh, another one that's uh, a newly launched project, there's not a lot of information on it yet, is called Crowbar. And that's a bare metal provisioning um, uh, tool that extends an open source tool called Chef, and it's sponsored by Dell and OpenStack. I think it's going to be a pretty important tool as time goes on, but um, they just launched it recently, and um, there isn't even a, a centralized wiki on it. But uh, if you Google crowbar and cloud or crowbar and chef, you're going to see it. But what that allows you to do is automate the installation of multiple cloud instances at scale. <coughs> Configuration management tools. Um, this is another probably, you know, the funny thing is that I, I'm in it a cloud guy and I make cloud software, but the tools are what I think are really, really interesting. And configuration management, especially in the way that these tools provide configuration management is really, really interesting. So if a lot of people, and I'm talking about configuration management mainly from a server perspective, even though there's definitely configuration management in the network that's slightly, slightly different. These are all very server centric. So BCFG2, is uh, 2003, he's been around a, a while. That is probably the least popular one, and I'm gonna skip past it real quick, and I'll come back to it. Because the next three, um, I did these in alphabetical order, because um, <clears throat> I don't wanna, I don't really have a preference, but there is sort of an evolution. This whole idea of taking your configurations and abstracting them in some kind of manifest or payload that allows you to um, push those configurations out across your whole infrastructure is what they do, these tools do. And CF Engine was started by a man named Mark Burgess, who was a researcher, um, and he had this idea that rather than go and edit each individual configuration file, he would come up with these definitions and abstractions of what the configuration should be and classes of, of servers, and then push these, implement these uh, definitions out automatically, or automate this across numerous servers. And so all these tools seem to work with most of the, the uh, Unix-like systems. Uh, CF Engine is probably as widely instrumented for not just um, Linuxes and Unixes, but also Windows to some degree. So CF Engine, granddaddy of them all. There was a CF Engine user who wanted to abstract and create a, an additional level of abstraction with some roles and other attributes of servers. And he created Puppet in 2004. His name is Luke Kinese, and his, he has a company behind um, Puppet called Puppet Labs that provides support and service. <clears throat> there was a Puppet user after him named Adam Jacob who was using Puppet and he had a bug and he didn't like exactly the way everything was working. So he created yet another system called Chef, which all three of these things at a very high level do the same thing. All four of these things, actually. You have these, these manifests, or in Chef's case, they're called cookbooks, puppets, or manifests that give you these definitions of how your server should be configured, and you can push them out, and you can have um, different levels of classes. So you could have all my Linux servers, and then you could have Apache servers should be configured this way, and you know my file servers could be configured this way, and so on and so on and they could have different roles within the organization. Um, that, that idea of automating and pushing it out across all these servers is uh, um, it's pretty important because your alternative is to, to configure them individually or create, create a you know, file, full, file that you push out and then make incremental changes across them. Um, Chef is uh, the tool that I was talking about that Crowbar integrates with. And they have an open source server called Chef Solo, and uh, they also have a company behind it called OpsCode that provides support and services and a hosted version of Chef. Tomorrow, uh, Garrett Honeycutt from Puppet Labs is doing a whole day tutorial on Puppet. I like them all, but since you're here and if you're interested in this, it's probably well worth your day to go um, listen to Garrett's talk. 
monitoring tools. Once again, I'll give my disclaimer. I spent the last four and a half years working on Xenos project. That's the one I'm gonna tell you I like the best. They're all pretty good um, up here and you I encourage you to download them all. Um, you have uh, Cacti, which leverages RRD tool that does performance monitoring. Um, it's embedded in some of the ones below there. How many people here are Nagios users? Nagios has probably got the largest user base of any monitoring project out there. They do uh, fault monitoring um, and alerting. You have OpenNMS. They're a Java-based um, network management solution. They've been around since 2000. GPL, Southeastern company. Um, Zabbix, I, Zabbix is sort of the, um, is developed by a uh, open source company in Russia. Um, interesting, I like, I like the, um, I think Nagios and Cacti are the most popular. I sort of like the bottom three because I think they have a little wider breadth of not just availability monitoring but performance monitoring as well. They do some other things like automatic discovery and things like that. Those are your list. Well, I think it comes to monitoring. There are thousands, there literally are thousands of monitoring package out there. These are the open source ones I think are, are solid and useful and you should pick the one that, that generally uh, works for you. Okay. Automation, this is also one of my favorites. Um, so automation and orchestration, orchestration tools or some stuff that accomplish tasks for you, either in a one-to-many relationship or one-to-one, -one, or ideally in a way that can uh, queue those jobs and do them with some kind of priority. Automate it, um, sort of more of a single uh, server tool. It sort of breaks by cloudy rule, but um, it's really a handy way to bring up a server and accomplish a lot of post-install tasks. Um, Capistrano, Capistrano was pretty popular for a while and then I think they uh, switched their project lead, which is sort of the, I, I'm all about open source projects, but when your project lead changes, sometimes that's not in, in less than favorable circumstances, then, then you might want to consider whether or not that project is one you want to depend on. Um, or where there isn't a, a critical mass of people developing that product behind that project in concert. Um, next thing we have is Rundeck. This is the one I think is the most interesting out there, um, simply because it allows you to um, uh, execute multiple scripts and jobs across your whole infrastructure with some kind of priority and take back and receive uh, feedback into your um, job scheduler. Does anybody use a software, does anybody here know what a run book is? Anybody use a run book? So a job scheduler that runs across your uh, uh, management architecture. This is the only thing in open source I've seen so far that comes close to that. If you've bla ever been in Blade Logic, heard of them, which was sort of the last evolution of these kind of tools um, across uh, blades. Run deck is, is pretty uh, interesting and it integrates with a lot of the tools I talked about already. Funk, Funk is a uh, uh, orchestration tool that uh, um, comes from the same people that developed uh, Cobbler. So it's an orchestration layer that's well integrated with Cobbler, should be worth looking at. M Collective is a orchestration layer that's integrated with Puppet. Um, look them up if you, if you pick some of your tools, these are sort of some, some that are already have tool chains that go together. So the reason I touched all this on all these parts is because at the end of the day, what I want you to do is come up with tool chains that automate the install configuration and starting and stopping of services within your cloud. And that's taking your cloud, whether it's Eucalyptus, OpenStack, CloudStack, Abiquo, starting your, your cloud image through some kind of automated install, whether it's Kickstart, Cobbler, Spacewalk, configuring it with Chef, CF Engine, Puppet, and there's actually a lot of integrations in those communities. There's integrations between Cobbler and Puppet. Um, there's integrations between Puppet and, Zeno and uh, uh, Rundeck and already out there, or you can create your own 
that once it's configured, brings the services into play. So I was rushing there towards the end because I have about seven minutes. So I wanted to give you guys a chance for questions. So, yeah. Yeah, URL for the slideshow is... Um, um, sh -sh -sh. Sorry. Sure. Rob. So the API standardization, right? Yep. Which I think is awesome, right? I mean, yeah. that helps so we can work things out. But right. obviously, the hardware providers have value add beyond just keeping the boxes up, keeping the network stable. I mean, obviously, they want to put things in the cloud, other ways, price, whatever. But like, do you see a, a space to have like the common API for stuff we do and a vendor to go? So the question is, do I ever see the evolution of a standard API? And I would say I would see some subset of API calls that would be standard across most cloud providers, which is pretty much happening today. But I think that the value that cloud providers are going to add are higher up the stack. So I think, for example, if I look at a cloud stack, we can, our APIs allow you to dynamically call and create um, VLANs. And some of the other cloud providers don't provide the ability to create VLANs. So those differentiating features, there's always going to be some, um, some stuff outside the API, but things that are standard like starting and stopping instances, creating and destroying instances. I could see that everybody would support some standards someday. So, but other questions? I, I can tell you right now, I didn't explain it that well. <laughs> Absolutely. Still, still, it's a lot to digest. And I mean, the thing that's really interesting is I talked about Compute Cloud because that's, a lot, that's the bottom, right? The next evolution of stuff that's going to be interesting is, and it is interesting today, is the past stuff. So the, you know, Heroku is really, really interesting. Um, I don't believe they're open source, but um, Fog is, and uh, um, I'm going to assume Makara will be. Um, but having the ability to, as developers, because there were a lot of developers' hands, to just go in there and buy and have the sandbox where the load balancing and the multi-tier architecture and all that kind of stuff is already developed. That's, that's pretty exciting. I mean, there is not a lot of value in the development team figuring out what their architecture should be for their application. I mean, there's a lot of value in them defining what their application needs, but making that happen is a waste of their time. That's not specialization. Security for cloud. I think that's, you know, that's the million dollar question. I mean, um, there's a lot of things that are no different from a security standpoint than there were in virtual private servers. There's a lot of um, changes, though, in different architectures and new software. I think it's a big concern. I, I think it's the number one concern. Oh, actually, of our survey results, I, it's the number two concern after lack of ta cloud training for people to adopt the cloud. So um, I don't know. I think there will be the security industry in general will have to instrument for cloud. I think it's, uh, but I think no matter what you put on the internet, whatever new service arrives, you still got to figure out what the security is around it. But I mean, obviously, by putting stuff in the public cloud, security becomes uh, a major consideration. Soft, open source software to look at cloud security uh, would be the same stuff that I would recommend for your legacy stuff. So um, Sourcefire, who does Snort and Plam AV, those are the two. I mean, Snort is an, an, an IDS and Clam AV is antivirus. Um, but there's also some sort of best practices stuff that I don't know that there's really a good, that I'm aware of, source of information on cloud security. Yeah, and the vendor, your vendor. Uh, here's the other thing, though. 
I, I, I noticed that the marketing guys at all these vendors have now cloud washed what they did before. And I don't know how much of that is thoughtful re-architecture or considering what cloud infrastructure looks like. And so, uh, um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a ton, all the management disciplines, I didn't even touch on single sign-on in the cloud. And I mean, um, that's a big thing, that, you know, a big um, question for a lot of enterprises. In that case, you have people like uh, Likewise Software that provides their software for single sign-on and open source. And, um, you know, you have the Samba, LDAP combinations to do that. And that's, I mean, I don't know that it's that much different, but now that you're putting, you're hosting somewhere else and you're not using your legacy Active Directory installs and stuff like that, you might need to look at federated authentication and single sign-on stuff like that that might have slight, slightly different nuance than in the legacy data center. Any other questions? Right. Um, my email is uh, mark at cloud.com. If you have any questions or um, I think my profile on SlideShare also links to my contact as well. Um, and it's in the slides. So um, if you have questions or uh, want to try out CloudStack or any of this other software and I can help you out, I'd be glad to. So thanks a lot. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.